Welcome to the overview of medieval mathematics. Uh, I am Lady Leonor da Costa, mundanely known as Sarah Thomas. Um, I am going to be your, your teacher tonight. Uh, this call is being recorded so that people who are not able to attend synchronously can uh, watch the recording and learn the math. So, um, just a, a kind of a quick um, overview of why we're here, what, what's going to happen when uh, in this course. Um, we're just going to talk about mathematics as a technology, what, what kind of uh, things you can do with mathematics. We're going to focus more on that than we are on um, like actually doing it. We're not going to do any mathematics. Um, if you really like doing mathematics, I can show you some stuff, but uh, I, I assume that most of you uh, probably do not like to do mathematics. Uh, otherwise, you'd be taking my other courses at Community College of Aurora. So... <laughs> Um, I, I do have a master's in math, and I and I teach uh, community college level. I'm at the, at, but I teach at concurrent enrollment at the high school, which is why my account is through Denver Public Schools. So, um, so let's just kind of get uh, kind of a, a handle on what we're going to be doing today. Uh, we're we're going to be looking at the numerals and the notations that people used for, for mathematics all around the world during that period. We're not just going to focus on Europe. We're also going to look at other cultures. Um, we're also going to uh, look at the changes that, that allowed these to evolve into the system we have today. Medieval mathematics doesn't look anything like the math you learned in high school. It's some of the same stuff, but it doesn't look like it. So we're going we're gonna to look at that as well. So one thing that, that we need to understand to inform our, uh, our discussion here is that math is a technology, just the same as science or, you know, the ability to, you know, bombard castle walls and things like that. Those are all technologies. Math is also a technology and it's interdependent with other technologies that a culture has. It, they're, they're not like completely separate. Um, the mathematics that you, the culture has can affect its technological development in various ways. And the technology that people develop can affect the mathematical development as well. So there's a feedback loop there. Um, so just to get some terms straight that we're going to be using, um, when we talk about a number, that's a quantity. So two is a number. A numeral is a symbol that represents that particular cardinal quantity. So if you, if you draw the little squiggle that people understand as the number two, that's called a numeral. It's not the number two. There's no two-ness about it. There's, I mean, if you wrote two tally marks, that would also signify the number two, or it might signify the number eleven, depending on how you're, um, how you're, how you're encoding num numerals. Okay, um, a digit is a symbol that's used as part of a numeral, and we use uh, what we, what are called decimal digits. These are our zero to nine digits that we're used to. Believe it or not, those are not always, they've, those have not always been in use. They did evolve during the medieval period. So we're going to look at that. Um, oh, and by the way, if you have questions, please feel free to, to pipe up and, you know, unmute yourself and ask because I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions you have during the presentation and after. So the, the, the one thing we need to understand about the system, uh, about different numeration systems is that some of them are positional and some of them are not. A positional numeration system is a system where the digits can represent different numbers in different positions. So like when we look at 2506, the two there represents 2000, but in 4025, the two is representing 20. So that digit means two different things depending on what position it's in. Not all numeration systems have that characteristic to them. Ours does, but not all of them do. Another thing that we need to understand about um, our numeration system is the role that zero plays. We have a fully functional zero. It, it, um, it serves as both a placeholder zero and a computational zero. A placeholder zero is one that, that's used in a positional numeration system to indicate that there's nothing in that position. 
Um, and then a computational zero is when you can actually do something like zero times five. If you can actually do that with your zero, it's a computational zero. And believe it or not, not all numeration systems have zeros that do those things. And not, not all of them have a zero at all. So the system that we have now is a base 10 positional place value system. It has a placeholder and computational zero. It has 10 digits. They're abstract symbols. They do not represent the number visually, despite what they may have told you in elementary school. I, 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 I really hate these, um, where they put the, like, the dots and they have you connect the dots to make the numeral. Um, that's not where the numerals came from. It's a system that somebody invented to help kids learn. Um, and it's a very, very modern system. These, these digits do not in any way abstractly or, or, or concretely represent the quantities that go with them. They're symbols, they're, and the symbols have evolved. Um, we also have algebra. We have a way to, to symbolically notate uh, equations using unknowns. We have these uh, four mathematical symbols and the equal sign. We have fractions with any denomination you want, any numerator you want. And we also have roots with any index. We can do cube roots, square roots, fourth roots, we can do all those kind of roots. We can even raise numbers to powers that are like irrational. And most of this did not exist in 600 AD. In fact, a lot of it didn't exist at 1600 AD. So let's take a look, uh, kind of a snapshot of where the world was when it came to mathematics in 600 AD at the beginning of what's traditionally been the SCA period. Um, in Europe, they had Roman numerals and finger numerals. They did not have our Hindu Arabic numerals. Those were going on in India and they were the precursors of the ones we have now. Um, in Asia, they had uh, stick numerals and glyph numerals. Uh, anybody who studied um, Asian languages like Chinese or Japanese that use kanji will, will uh, know what I'm talking about, those glyph numerals. They, ha they have kanji for the various numerals. Um, in in uh, Hebrew and Greek, they used a lot of numerology which is uh, what people are talking about when they when they um, they talk about like the number of the beast is six hundred and sixty six. Um, you used, used to be able to, and I'll I'll elaborate on this a little bit more. You used to be able to find a numeric value that goes with a word in those languages, and so then that people made all kinds of uh, cabalistic well, the things that Kabbalah is about is you know finding numerical or numerological connections between words and concepts. In Mesoamerica, they had Mayan numerals, and we'll look at those as well. As far, so there's lots of different types of numerals, and they were mutually um, unintelligible. Like somebody from Asia would have looked at Roman numerals and gone, what the heck? Um, as far as computation goes, um, like how do you actually do a, a math problem? How do you add two numbers? Uh, in Europe, they would use a line abacus or counting board, and there were all kinds of different uh, abaca abaci, abacuses, uh, for those who don't like Latin plurals, um, that had involved like beads or things uh, sliding along wires, strings, or other, uh, other type devices. Um, in Asia, they had a grid abacus, um, and that's what they used with the stick numerals. Uh, there were also bead ab abacuses, um, that are the type that people are used to thinking of as an abacus. When you think of an abacus, you picture um, like wires with beads on them and they're separated by a divider into two segments, uh, one of which has fewer beads than the other. That's that kind of a thing. So those did exist in 600 AD in Asia. Um, in Mesoamerica, they had various uh, computation devices um, there were people who were trained to use them that were specialists. Um, and one, one of their more interesting uh, devices was a table that had, it was almost like um, a model of a city with different heights and the different heights represented different place values. So that, that, that's an interesting thing to look at if you, it's, uh, anyway, that's, that's something, something really cool you can look at later. Uh, as far as what kind of things they could do, um, mathematically speaking. So this would be like your outcomes from your algebra class, okay? Um, in Europe, India, the Middle East, and Asia, they could do arithmetic. So all your plus minus 
times divide. Uh, they could do fractions, although it looked very different than what we did today. Do today, uh, they could solve linear equations. So you know, your three x plus two equals seven. Okay, that that kind of equation. Okay, they could solve that kind of equation. They could also solve quadratic equations, provided they had real roots, because imaginary numbers and negative numbers had not been invented yet. Um, they could also solve systems of linear equations. And another thing that, that they could solve is linear Diophantine equations. Now, that's not one you see in your high school curriculum. That's basically a linear equation in two variables. But instead of having a system of two of them, you only get one. And they have multiple solutions. So hang on a sec. I'm going to let somebody in. Hi, and welcome. Oh, I, while I'm here, I should put the uh, link to the handout in the chat. Ooh, musical notation as numeration. Yeah, that that's a that's something we'd have to look at in another in another uh, at another time. That's not in our presentation tonight. Let's go back to. Uh, from this side. Okay. Um, in Mesoamerica, they, they could do arithmetic and they could do ratios. Now, the, the way they did their math is very different from the European model. So that's something we'll talk about in a minute. By 1600 AD, here's, here's what things looked like. They looked a lot more modern than it did in 600 AD, but it still wasn't completely there. Like someone from 1600 AD if they came, if they were somehow transported to our time to look at our mathematics, they wouldn't know what we were talking about. They wouldn't understand our notation. Um, it would look kind of familiar, but it wouldn't be something that they could really do. They'd probably pick up on how to do it if they knew how to do mathematics, but uh, yeah. So by then we had the uh, Hindu Arabic numerals. They're like the ones we have now, uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all those digits. They are standardized and they are prevalent in, in Europe and in other places in the world as well. Numerology is still in use. So people are still trying to find numbers that go with words and concepts and trying to make connections between them based on those numbers. As far as computation, symbolic computation, which is the kind that you learned how to do in school, is now commonplace. So, um, for example, people could be taught to do two times three by using digit two and the digit three. Before, they weren't able to do that <laughs> because they didn't have that symbolic computation that we have now. Um, there are still lots of Abasai in use, lots of, lots of different types. Um, they have a different type in Russia. They have a different type in, in Italy. They have they're all different types. Um, algebraic notation is becoming popular, but it doesn't look like the one we have today. Um, as far as what they could do with these, um, you could solve the general cubic. Um, hi, Fia. Okay, so you, we could, you could, they could solve the general cubic. Making me do this. Okay, so any cubic equation. That means all the ones, even the ones that didn't have real roots. So they had imaginary numbers by then. Uh, in fact, that was a late period invention. Uh, trigonometry became popular. It came from India, believe it or not. Um, a, lot of, a lot of people think of trigonometry as more of a Greek thing, but the, the trigonometry that we have today is, is what came out of India. Um, also late in the period, analytic geometry was born. That was, that was the um, big mathematical accomplishment of the philosopher René Descartes. Um, he's the guy who's responsible for you getting the equation y equals x squared plus 6 and having to graph it and get a parabola. That's his invention. Okay? That's, um, he, took, he took curves, which were known about, and which the Greeks, ancient Greeks did stuff with, and he took equations, which the... the um, the Arabs knew about, and he married the two together. Um, also at that time, about 1600, 
Uh, we were starting to see the beginnings of calculus and probability as mathematical disciplines. Probability is uh, well known as the only mathematical um, branch of only branch of mathematics ever invented to help people win at cards. That is the reason for the invention of probability. Statistics is all about getting good beer. That's that's a topic for another one. Any questions so far? Feel free to unmute yourself and ask. Okay, let's move on. Let's talk about numerals and different numeration systems. Because I, I talked about this before where, where there, some numeration systems are not uh, positional and some of them are not base 10. Okay, um, by the time that we uh, move into 600 AD, most surviving numeration systems are base 10. Um, there was a base 60 system back in, in ancient Babylon, and that's why we have 360 degrees in a circle today. Uh, yes, it is a holdover from ancient Babylon. <laughs> um, Anyway, so, so Roman numerals we're all familiar with. We had to learn these in school. And you may have been like scratching your head going, how the heck did the Romans do two plus three? Right? Because they did they do I, I plus I, I, I equals V? What? Okay, you, you may have been wondering that. Um, the answer is they didn't. <laughs> you cannot do symbolic computation with no Roman numerals. This is the major disadvantage of Roman numerals is you cannot do that kind of computation. You have to use an abacus. So you are tied to an abacus if you want to do any math with Roman numerals. It, so it is a base 10 system. It's not positional, meaning that an I in the first position is, doesn't, isn't worth the same as an I in the another position. Uh, I is always worth one. It's an additive and a subtractive system. So, for example, if you have I, 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 that's three, uh, three times one, three ones, which makes three. But if you have I, V, that's a subtraction. You're taking five, V, and adding, or sorry, subtracting one. Um, anytime you have, in Roman numerals, a lesser value symbol coming before a higher value symbol, it's a subtraction. Anytime they're in order, it's an addition. So it is, an, it is both an additive and subtractive system. Um, the highest numeral you can get in Roman numerals, and this is another disadvantage of Roman numerals, is a million. That's the highest you can get, and only that, that only with an extended Roman numeral system. There's no um, official, like, basic Roman numerals past M, and so you would just have to go M, 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 so you can see, it, for any of you who have ever done any science with scientific notation, this system is very limiting when it comes to advanced science. You cannot do those kind of computations. You can't write Avogadro's number in Roman numerals. It just doesn't work. They don't have the numerals for it. So in Hebrew and Greek, they both had this, this characteristic where they used letters for numerals. They did not have separate numeral symbols like we do. Imagine if A always was one and B was two and C was three and so on and so forth. So that, that's how it is for the Hebrew and Greek numerals. They used letters. And you can see what they did with, the, with their system. They, um, they would go do the numerals one through 10. Notice no zero, there's no zero. They would do the numerals one through 10, and then the next one after that was in alphabetical order was 20, 30, 40, 50, and so on up to 100. And then they would go 200, 300, 400, 500, 600, 700, 800. And if they had, had enough letters, they could get to 900. You can see the Hebrew alphabet does not have enough letters to get over 400. Okay. Um, so the biggest number you could represent in Hebrew would be 499. You can't get a bigger number than that. However, the, the thing that this numeration system does that ours does not is it allows you to translate words into numbers. So you, you, if you had, you know, 
if you had a word like eta, it's it starts with an eta and then it has a tau and then it has an alpha. Okay, so you'd take your eta, which is eight, and your tau, which is 300, and your alpha is one. So the number 309 corresponds to the word eta. Um, and that enables numerology. And there's actually still numerology going on out in the world. It's been discredited as a science. It's no longer considered a science, but it's still out there. And people are still ascribing all kinds of uh, I don't know, Da Vinci Code stuff to it. One thing that was used in Europe that's really interesting is finger numerals. Okay, This is a non-positional system. There, there's no zero, and it was used for business negotiations. So the way that they would do it is they, uh, if, they, if you wanted to negotiate with someone, you were basically doing it where other people could hear you. And if you didn't want people to overhear your conversation about what price you were getting for, a stuff, for something you were selling or something you were buying, um, you'd want to make sure this was as, as secretive as possible. And most, most people couldn't write, or if they could write, if you wrote on something, people could get hold of it, right? Unless you burned it immediately, people could get, get their hands on it and know what it meant. So uh, what they would do with, is, with these finger numerals is they, you'd, you'd hide, you'd touch hands underneath your sleeves. No one could see your hands and you would, and you would read them by touch. So if somebody wanted to indicate that they wanted to give you 70 for something, you can see the sign for 70. And these, these are, uh, what these are doing is touching various knuckles or, or joints of the hand with different fingers. Um, if you wanted to give them 300 florins or whatever, you can see the sign for 300. You could make that sign. They could feel it in their hand and they could know that you were offering them 300. And you could say out loud, that's not a good enough price. Okay, then you, you might signal, you might put a finger down, okay, 400. Okay, see how it works. Um, and this is where we get this ancient dirty math joke. Um, I, know that, I know you all came here just for the ancient dirty math joke. So here's how it goes. Um, they would say that so-and-so had, uh, had left for the market with 90 and came home with 30. And I'll let you take a minute to look at the finger, finger numerals and you tell me what it means. So yes, there, there, there were gay people and dirty jokes back in the day. Okay, um, these are Chinese stick numerals. It's a base 10 positional system. It has a computational and a placeholder zero. This is why the Chinese were so far ahead of everybody because they had a numeration system that would allow them to do all kinds of computations. They also had decimal fractions, which the Europeans did not have. The Europeans were still using the kludgy Egyptian system. Um, these stick numerals were used on a grid abacus, and you can see over on the uh, right-hand side of the abacus, they're using glyph numerals. And you can also see um, up on the top, at the very, very top, you can see glyph numerals as well. But uh, the way they would, they would uh, lay these sticks, notice that they every other square lays a different direction. So like on, on that second row of, of numerals on the grid, um, there's four, you'll see there's four horizontal sticks, and then the next one has three vertical sticks, and then the next one has five horizontal, one vertical. Now the next one over, you'll see there's a vertical and a horizontal. That's actually counting horizontal, um, because that indicates um, five. So you can have five individual sticks, but um, anybody who's ever tried to like count by eye understands that any more than about three or four, you're not going to be able to count it without visually moving your eyes, one, two, three, four, five. Um, and so that's that's why that uh, re symbol represents five. You can also represent it with the five sticks. Um, and so they could actually do operations by manipulating those sticks. It makes it very easy to carry. If you get 10, you just carry, literally carry a stick to the next column. And th this is, uh, I can't remember what, if this is a division or multiplication problem, but it's a, it's, it's a problem in progress. 
Now let's take a look at Mayan numerals. Uh, this is a base 20 system. This is the system that rocks the boat. Everywhere else is using base 10 by now, but uh, the Mayans are still using base 20. They use, uh, because 20 is a big number, they use a sub base of five. So what a sub base is, is um, it's kind of a resting point in between your counting from, from one to whatever your base is. Um, so when, when they, and they also followed the principle of you can't really count more than four objects with your eyes. So when they, so a dot would represent one, two dots were two, three dots were three, four dots were four, and five was now a line. So uh, that's, our, that's why it's a sub base, because it's now represented by a different symbol. Um, and then, of course, it's, it's an additive system. So if you have a line and two dots, that's five and two, which is seven. Um, they had a placeholder zero, which is meant to look like a turtle shell. That's supposed to be a turtle shell. Uh, but it was not a computational zero. You couldn't multiply numbers by shell. Okay. Uh, it's also not a pure base 20. They had two different systems going on. One of them was a pure base 20 system. But on the other one, the second column was base 18. So you'd get up to 18 and then kick over to the next column rather than 20. And that what that did was it made 360 a nice round number for them. And that made it easier to do astronomical calculations. The Mayan astronomers could predict with very good accuracy for their day um, things like the rising of Venus and, and other astronomical events. Um, and they didn't have any division or fractions either. They did it all by ratios, which is astonishingly good. But uh, yeah, I, th that's why they had an alternate system. But having two different numeration systems makes it very, very difficult to actually do like the kind of computations you'd have to do to build a bridge or something like that. Um, so these are our modern Hindu Arabic numerals. You, these are the ones that you're familiar with. And you can see down at the bottom what the 16th century ones looked like. And they're very, they're recognizable as the numbers we have today. You, you can look at those and go, oh, that's a four. Okay. Um, but you can see up at the top what they originally looked like were more like the Chinese numbers, at least the first numbers were. And what evolved was basically a, a shorthand that people got too lazy to lift their pen. And so, and so you can see how the numeral two and three evolved uh, by people trying to draw three bars and not lifting their stylus or whatever. Um, but you can see that, you know, while six and seven look kind of like what we were used to, they kind of went through an evolution where they didn't. And, uh, and of course, Four and five and eight and nine don't look a whole lot like what we uh, what we are familiar with. Um, you can kind of track the evolution of these. Um, you can kind of see where the zero came in as well. And the zero was originally like a little circle or a or a dot. It represented the void, nothingness. It was a computational zero as well as a placeholder zero. Um, now, the way it arrived in Europe uh, was through the Middle East. Um, the Arabs adopted these numerals because they were quite useful. You, you could actually do symbolic computation with them, unlike Roman numerals or other systems that were out there. Um, I mean, you, like you can do stick numeral computations, but once your, your uh, grid abacus overturns, your computation is gone, right? You can't write them down like that. So... Um, so what happened was they came through the Middle East to Europe and uh, Pope Sylvester was the one that brought them to Europe about around a thousand AD. It's kind of an interesting story. He, he encountered them when he went to college in, in Spain, in what is now Spain. And um, so he, he kind of brought them to, to Europe as, and encouraged people to use them. There were people who, who were aware of them, but they were thought to be demonic because they were associated with Muslims. Um, that stigma has never left them. They, <laughs> they numbers today still have that stigma in some in some uh, ways. Those of you who are like, oh yeah, math class with no no homework and no tests, I'm in. Okay, yeah, you you all are bearing that stigma. <laughs> okay, any questions? Please feel free to unmute yourself.
All right, let's move on to uh, computation and algebra. Let's look at what you could do with these numbers. This illustration that started us off is from Margarita Philosophica. It's a woodcut. Um, now you'll see in the illustration, there's Boethius and Pythagoras, and they're identified by uh, the ribbons that are next to them. Boethius is on the left, Pythagoras is on the right. Clearly Pythagoras is not dressed like an ancient Greek, but we won't go there. Um, they're, what they're doing in this picture is they're having a contest. They're having an arithmetic contest. Um, and this is being overseen by Lady Arithmetic. You can tell it's her because A, she has a ribbon telling who she is, and B, she has uh, symbols on her gown. So you can see what um, Pythagoras has. He's got a counting board. Um, this is this isn't a type of abacus, um, and it's you you move little stones or coins or pebbles or whatever you got um, around the the board to to do computations. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll look some more at that in a minute. Um, Boethius, however, on the left is using Hindu Arabic numerals, which you can recognize, although they're kind of upside down. And uh, he's also using fractions. Now, interestingly enough, he's not just using Egyptian fractions, which are uh, a fraction with a numerator of one. He's got two thirds there. That's really interesting because that was not one of the things that, uh, that people used a lot back in the day. This is a new in, new technology, new invention. So you can see they're having a contest. I wonder who is winning. I have my guesses. Uh, Boethius, by the way, would not have worn that either because that's the, the fashion of the time that this woodcut was written. But And he'd also was, lived and died before the Hindu-Arabic numerals made it to Europe, but that's another story. So this is a counting board. Let's take a look at uh, what counting boards can do. Um, these are grids that are etched or painted on table surfaces that you can carry them from place to place. Uh, you could also draw this grid on a piece of fabric, okay? And uh, then you could roll that up and take it with you. Now, once you roll it up, all your counters are going to move to different places. And so you can't preserve a value that way, but you can do the computation that way. Um, in fact, the reason the Office of the Exchequer is what it is, is because they used a, a cloth abacus, a cloth counting board, and it was kind of checkerish. So the way you would use a counting board, the lines represent powers of 10, and the, the things that are put on it are called calculi. Calculus is Latin for a little stone, and like a pebble. And so, um, so it's kind of ironic that, uh, that one of our higher branches of mathematics that we learn in school is named after little stones. But, uh, but that's what, that, that's what that are, those are called. Those are called calculi, or calculus is singular. Um, when you put a calculus on the board, that in, the place indicates its value. So if you put it on the line, it indicates the Roman numeral that's written on that line. So I'll, I'll go back to the previous um, illustration. You can see X, M, uh, see, see, the, uh, see there's Roman numerals over here, okay? If we go back to the... Boethius, when he doesn't have the numerals, but you can see that there's a symbol up here saying which way is up. Okay. Um, so if you put it on the line that represents that, or that's marked with that Roman numeral, that indicates it's one of those. So if you put it on the line that says X, you're indicating that the calculus represents 10. If you put it between two lines, it's the five value that's between those two lines. So if you put it between the X line and the C line, you're indicating that it means 50. That's the five value that's between. 10 and 100, okay? And you can use it to do addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Um, let's talk about fractions for a minute because we're used to having some very powerful fractions. Um, fractions were not always that powerful. And until those decimal fractions that we have now were invented, uh, Egyptian fractions were the world standard. They all have numerators of one. So if, if you wanted to make a fraction that today we would use like three fourths, um, you would have to represent it as a sum of two Egyptian fractions, one half plus one fourth. You could have sums of up to four Egyptian fractions. It's actually been proven in more recent times that um, it takes no more than four Egyptian fractions to represent any um, rational number. Um, 
So what you had to do, if you, if you wanted to add a half and a fourth and another fraction that was like a half and a third and a sixth and a twelfth, um, you, would, you would have to look that up on a table. And, and the rind papyrus, it, it, uh, which you can see here uh, in, in the illustration, that dates back to 1650 BC. It has fraction tables for Egyptian fractions. Now, as far as finding an algorithm for them, that was a later development. Uh, Fibonacci wrote, that, wrote one in uh, 1202 AD, so they were still in use at that time. Egyptian fractions were the world standard until decimal fractions were invented. As far as algebra goes, our word algebra comes from the title of the definitive textbook that was written by Al-Khwarizmi um, during the medieval period in uh, Arabic. And this is the title page of it in the, in the illustration. And uh, so we, they were able to solve systems of two linear equations in two variables and also Diophantine equations. That's one linear equation in two variables. Those have been solvable since antiquity. There are ancient Babylonian manuscripts, um, or well, not manuscripts because they didn't write on paper, but you, you get the picture. They could do it in ancient Babylon. Okay. Um, but uh, Al Khwarizmi uh, talked about like solving um, quadratic equations, some cubic equations. He can only solve limited cubic equations. Okay, as as far as solving quadratic equations, those date back to Babylonian times too. Uh, Brahmagupta, an Indian mathematician, it's about 628 A.D., invented the quadratic formula or a quadratic formula. It's not the one we see today it, because they didn't have imaginary numbers and they didn't have um, negative numbers at that time. So um, he could only find positive real solutions, but he had a formula for them. Simon Stevin in 1594 AD, late, late period, invented the quadratic formula that we have today or the, the idea behind it anyway. As far as the symbols that we, rec that we represent it with, that's different. That's more modern. Um, the Chinese, of course, having a superior numeration system, could solve all cubic equations by uh, um, by the seventh century. They could, they could solve some of them by the second century, um, and they could also solve some quartic equations. Those are ones with x to the fourth in them in our modern notation. They could solve some of those as well, and they had both uh, numerical and uh, and exact methods. The difference between a numerical method and an exact method is an exact method will tell you exactly what the solution is, and a numerical method will get you as good a, an approximation to the solution as you want. It'll estimate the solution. Um, now, this is a, a topic for another presentation. I'm actually working on a PowerPoint for that, is uh, the Italian race to solve the general cubic in the 1500s. Um, this is a tale, a, a sordid tale of getting people drunk and industrial espionage. So uh, that's, that's a whole other presentation. Um, but Cardano was the one who ultimately published it. And this is his manuscript that you see in the picture, or, or not his manuscript, it's a, from the book, from his book. Notice the notation. I want you to take a look about uh, three fourths of the way down. You can see his notation. Um, you can see there's, you know, it's D, F, cubum, A, E, per D, A, triplum, C, B, in quadratum, A, B, per D, E, triplum, A, B, in quadratu. Okay, you don't understand that because it's not the notation that we currently use. Um, nevertheless, it is a method that if you understand the notation, you can follow with modern symbols and you can solve a cubic equation that way. Um, now, as far as like a different, a, a solution more like the ones we use today, uh, the, the method that Cardano used is not the one taught in, in college algebra classes today to solve a cubic equation. It's um, the one we use today is, a, is uses some more modern techniques, but it cannot solve all cubic equations. So it's, it's kind of interesting that we, that we kind of regressed in that respect. Um, but as far as like a, a trigonometric solution that kind of married that trigonometry to solving cubic equations, uh, that was uh, Viet and Descartes very late in the period. It was after the uh, race to solve the general cubic in, in Italy. <laughs> so let's look at uh, some of the notation that we that we have today. 
Um, the fraction bar was not invented until the Islamic golden age. Um, up until then, to, to represent an Egyptian fraction with Arabic numerals, you would write the numeral and put a bar over it. So you would, if you wanted to say one half, you'd have two with a bar over it. Of course, that bar means something different today. It means a repeating decimal fraction. Um, the plus and minus signs were invented in the 14th century. Now, in the 1500s, um, Var variables have been in use for a long time. In ancient Egypt, they called their variable aha, or heap, just like a pile of stuff. Um, in Babylonia, they called it the uh, first brass ring and the second brass ring. So in the 1500s, um, a variable that we would call today X, they would call CO, which was short for cosa, which means thing. So again, variables are just stuff. Um, CE was senso, that was a square. CU meant which was short for cubo, meant the, the cube of the variable. Um, the radical sign, the one that indicates square roots, was invented in the, about around 1520. Robert Record in 1557 invented the equal sign. So yeah, they were solving equations before they had an equal sign. Uh, decimal notation, uh, 1585, Simon Stevin. Francois Viette invented our modern algebraic notation in 1591. And uh, William Autred, 1631, uh, that's what, 40 years after, invented the multiplication sign. So that one was late to the game. Any questions? Let me take a look. Okay, so so someone uh, didn't get the dirty joke. So so let me uh, make sure my camera is on so you can see. Okay, so so this is the numeral ninety, and this is the numeral thirty. <laughs> he left for the market with ninety, and he came back with thirty. Okay, just just so you're aware. Now you know a dirty math joke that no one else will understand. <laughs> Questions? Feel free to unmute yourself or ask in the chat. I'm, I'm curious, um, what other topics in mathematics would you like to see a presentation on? Like, was there anything in here that kind of intrigued you and you want to see more of that or anything like that? Wow, you guys are as noisy as my students. Ah, geometry. Geometry is a good one. I'll write that down. Because I can do more classes. <laughs> Yeah, geometry dates back to the ancient Greeks, and they actually were masters of it. They had um, works on it that did not make it through the, the um, destruction of the library in Alexandria. But nevertheless, we do know they had some pretty advanced stuff. They almost got to calculus for, through a geometrical perspective. So that's, that's kind of interesting. They had the idea of like limits and things like that. Really like the evolution of mathematics. Thank you. Yeah, it's kind of an interesting topic. A lot of people take for granted what we have today. And uh, did they do proofs? Yes, they did do proofs in ancient Greece. Yes, they did geometric proofs. Now, they didn't do the two-column proof that, that is the bane of every high schooler's existence, but they did do proofs. And, and uh, in, if I do a future class on geometry, I... Um, I can get into that. Um, Althea asks, how different maths did different things? You said mine was good for astronomy, but not other things. Um, yeah, that's that's a whole other issue is like how math engages with engineering. Um, because nowadays we're, we're accustomed to engineers 
calculating things, and they do use a lot of calculus and you know advanced tools like that. Um, but math and engineering were not always as friendly to each other as they are today. Uh, as far as like what you could do, like imagine imagine if you had to use Egyptian fractions. Could you do a lot of like fraction multiplication or anything like that? That would be a pain in the rear. You would not want to do that. You would have to be a highly trained specialist with a lot of time on your hands to do fraction multiplication. So any kind of, of thing that involved fraction multiplication, uh, you would not be able to do very easily. And even though something can be done, that doesn't mean it can be done easily, and that doesn't mean it could be done by any school child. Um, that's another issue, too, is that people were not always educated in the ways that we think of today. We teach every single one or most of our youth to do advanced algebra that people would have found, people would have, you know, done industrial espionage and killed for back in the 1500s. So it, the, the role that mathematics plays in society is a whole other topic. Well, that's a good question. Uh, how much math would regular people know? Uh, most people, not a whole lot. Um, wealthier people or people who were tradesmen might know enough uh, arithmetic to, to get by. So they would know, for example, that if they sold 300... Uh, 300 goats for, I don't know, 10 pence a piece or whatever, they would be able to do that multiplication and figure out how much money it was supposed to be. As far as like algebra, no, <laughs> they couldn't, they couldn't do algebra, but they could probably do arithmetic. Um, but, but your average everyday peasant would not need to reckon at all. Just enough to pay their taxes. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. I appreciate you showing up to my class and uh, asking good questions and giving good input. Thank you.